interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon on his National Cousins Day tone. Any cousins you'd like to say hello to? And Tony Kornheiser, my two favorites, Kirk and Demarcus. You know, when we have a family meal, we call him Boogie, so it's Kirk and Boogie. That's how it works. Nobody has more first cousins than me. Nobody has as many. When your father is one of 20 children and your mother's one of 11, nobody has pumped out as many first cousins as my family's. That's it. I got the record, baby. Aren't you happy that you don't have to support them all? Doesn't that yeah. make you happy? <laughs> no. Welcome it's to Port VI, boys and girls. In today's episode, Canada Cops to Espionage, Formula One debates air conditioning, and Jeff Passan joins us for five good minutes on baseball's upcoming trade deadline. But we begin today with rookie phenom Paul Skeens finally losing a game in the majors, but going into the ninth inning for the Pirates and giving up only four hits and two earned. Skeens had started 11 games for Pittsburgh before losing this one, and the Pirates crowd gave him a standing ovation nonetheless. Wilbon, do you see this performance as a negative or a positive for Skeens? Tony, the only negative in this performance for me, and I paid attention to this game last night, is that Skeens lost to the Cardinals, who I hate more than anybody except the Cheeseheads. That's the only downer. We're talking about you and I right. often, and particularly lately, talk about starting pitching, the dearth of it, the decline of it. And here's Skeens, who in my division I'm also scared of as a Cub fan. I mean, he was great again. I, I jokingly said yesterday they'll never let him go eight and a third. He goes eight in the five. When he came back out for the ninth, I'm like, whoa. I was glad yeah, to see yeah. it, Tony. I think it's a step in the right direction. Do I think it's going to be trending? No, I don't. I think the Pirates, you know, their brass or their analytics people may have regrets and they'll try to go a different direction next time. His attitude after the game, he talked about the ovation he got and the attention on a Tuesday night. It was all great yeah. except he lost to the damn yeah. Cardinals. That's it. Everything else yeah. about it was terrific. So if I wanted to cast this in a negative light, what I would say is he went into the ninth inning for the first time. He gave up two hits and a run. Maybe he faltered. He went over 100 pitches for the first time. Maybe he faltered. But he had eight strikeouts and he had no walks. He's now, and I love these numbers, he's now 6-1. and one. His ERA is 1-9-3. He has 97 strikeouts in almost 75 innings. All of that is positive. He's a rookie who started the All-Star game. Mike, he's the first pitcher ever, and I emphasize ever, to have an ERA under 2 and more than 90 strikeouts in his first 12 starts. The people in Pittsburgh know what they have. That's why they gave him a standing ovation. He has come out of yeah. no hitters twice in the seventh, Mike. And I'm going to disagree with you because it does really seem to me now that the Pirates know what they're doing with him. They're trying to avoid injury and at the same time grow a big league starter. And I, I think they've got to get credit for where they are with him at this moment. Don't you think? Tony, I wasn't speaking in narrow terms about the Pirates. I don't care about the Pirates. I'm talking about Major oh. League Baseball. I don't think that's going to be trending. But I agree with you about him. Tony, this reminds yeah. me, again, my team is the Cubs, of a young Kerry Wood. And when he would yeah. go out there and you'd go to the ballpark thinking, my God, this is something that, you know, we, you, you don't see. This is a unicorn. So good for yeah. him. Yes, it's exciting good. to watch him. Just wish he'd be yep. in the Cardinals. And by the way, the hit, the first hit, the leadoff hit in the, in the, in the ninth, it was so late. The ball is past the left-hand hitter, and he squirts it, you know, down the left field line. It's just so late because he, he couldn't get around on it. But, again, Cardinals, I hate the Cardinals. The Paris Olympics are barely underway. Canada is already apologizing for espionage. The Canadian Olympic Committee said sorry to New Zealand and sent home an assistant coach and an analyst, whatever that is, for the women's soccer team, after the analyst got busted for spying on a New Zealand practice with a drone. Canada's head coach, Bev Priestman, said she, was gonna, she will remove herself from tomorrow's opener between the two countries, but that's it. Tone, are Canada's steps sufficient? Yeah, I just want to make sure you hate the Cardinals before we go any further. Are Canada's yeah, that's good. steps that's sufficient? The only other thing they could do, Mike, honestly is forfeit the game and send the entire team home. They sent home the offending people attached to the team, and the coach has, has removed herself from this 
particular game. I mean, clearly, they used a the drone to record practice, which we like to call in the NFL the Patriot way. But yeah. I, I mean, yeah. this is good enough for me. What I wondered about, Mike, was this. Is New Zealand that good that you have to do this? And then I was told that Canada no. is ranked eighth in the world and Canada is the defending Olympic champion and New Zealand is ranked 28th in the world. So it seems to me a little bit of an overkill. But Mike, people cheat in sports, in all sports. They do. They steal signs they in do. baseball. They steal signals in football. They foul too hard deliberately in basketball. They use drugs in swimming, in weightlifting, in cycling. That's what Track they do in order to win. And if they didn't cheat, Mike, if they didn't cheat, we wouldn't need all the referees. Yeah, Tony, I agree with you. I think the one thing you could do, if, if there's a competition committee, you know, the Olympics themselves could say the International Olympic Committee must have some committee under it, which looks at these things and could say, you know, head coach, you're going away for more than just the one game. This is not like suspending Harbaugh for okay. the first half of some big team. You, you, you're going home for maybe, I don't know, the whole opening round before we get to the medal round if Canada's lucky enough to do that. You could do that unless these other people have okay. to go away. But a drone, oh my yeah. God, this is, I mean, you know, and this is so Olympics, Tony, isn't it? It's just, you know, somebody's well, going to try know, to get an edge. You're right. They're going to cheat. Yes. But I like the fact that it's a drone story. I want to know, did they pack the drones in their carry-ons, or did they put it right through in a regular <laughs> airport going to Paris? Did they buy it in Paris? My drones are everywhere just in fly sports. It. You can't, at a golf fly tournament, there. you can't hit a seven iron without hitting a drone anymore. They're everywhere. Let's move. Famed F1 driver Lewis Hamilton says drivers don't need air conditioning in their cars, as has been recently considered. Hamilton said, quote, this is Formula One. It's always been like this. We are highly paid athletes. you got to train your butt off to make sure you can withstand the heat, unquote. But it's also true that in a recent race in Qatar, three drivers were negatively affected by extreme heat. One quit the race. Another threw up in his helmet. Wilbon, do you agree with Hamilton that they don't need air conditioning? Tony, I don't quite know what to think on. This is fascinating, and it's difficult. I mean, when you have Lewis Hamilton saying this. I mean, somebody who has been at the top. I mean, he's certainly one of the GOATs. I, I, I am interested to hear at some point what Mac Verstappen says about this as well, because you want to get more than one really a, a, opinion about it. But if you've got safety issues, all right, and you've got speeds that these people, cars, vehicles are traveling at, and they are yeah, danger to yeah. each other and to, to, to spectators, then, okay, I got to pay attention to this. But on the other hand, if as Lewis Hamilton says, I have trained myself to do this, don't take away essentially an advantage that I've built up yeah. over time so you can just make it comfy for everybody else. I sort of understand that too. I don't know enough about this to try to, you know, sit here and give a hot take. This is fascinating to me though. I'm going to say that I agree with Lewis Hamilton in this regard, that they don't need air conditioning. They've been racing like this for decades, and you rarely hear about people lapsing into delirium or getting sick in the car. The heat in Qatar is so excessive that that may be an outlier. But if the, if, if the government, in effect, of F1 is talking about going to air conditioning, then I think you have to listen to it. I know when I get in my car... The first thing I turn on is the air conditioning. It's not the GPS. It's not the radio. It's not the navigation. It's the AC, baby. Summers in Washington are unbearably hot. And if I don't have air conditioning in my car, I'm either going to take a bus or I'm never going to leave my house. If Lewis Hamilton wants to be a tough guy, that's okay. But you're right. Let's hear from Verstappen. Let's hear from other people in this. Because if because yeah. there is a significant possible danger of people fainting, and then there's a Legit. then there's a multi car wreck. Don't you have know, control. You know, put in yeah. the air conditioning. Try the and air conditioning. And by the way, you're, you're not taking a bus. Try it. You're not taking a bus, Ralph Cramden. Let's really? let, let me you know. Let's just get really? that straight. And you know that last time you, know you took last a bus, time I was, was on when? a bus. Do you know the last when? time I was on a bus? Not that long ago. Yeah. Sometime in this century. Ago. Let's take a break. <laughs> Coming up, will the Tigers move Tarek Skubal? We're going to ask Jeff Passon. We'll also ask him to react to Mike Trout leaving his rehab start.
with knee soreness. I'm going to take that bet and say it's not been this century. And there's no, no way in the last kidding. 24 years you've taken a bus. I asked Jeff Leonardo. I took the bus all the time. Come on now. Oh, that. Baseball's trade deadline is Tuesday at 6 p.m. And to find out who's eyeing whom, we welcome back our great friend, ESPN senior MLB insider, Jeff Passan. Jeff, let's start with this. Wilbon and I, the other day, we discussed whether the Tigers should trade or keep their ace, Tarek Skubal. What do you think is the more likely outcome? It's likelier, Tony, that I think he stays with the Detroit Tigers. They feel like they're building something really good there. And it's not just Tarek Skubal. They've got Jackson Job, who's the best pitching prospect in the minor leagues. And more than anything, when you have a true ace, and I do believe that Tarek Skubal is a true ace at this point, you just don't trade him. It's not something that teams do, particularly teams that are on the upswing and while other organizations around baseball believe that the Tigers could absolutely make out like bandits here if they decided to do so and maybe position themselves even better going forward, uh, the idea of trading a superstar is a really, really hard thing to do. You saw what happened when the Boston Red Sox did it with Mookie Betts. Uh, you saw what happened uh, when the Yankees got Juan Soto and their offense at least became somewhat respectable accordingly. Uh, to go and deal Scooble at this point it could happen if there is a godfather offer, but the likelihood at this point is just not all that high. Here, here. That's what I like to hear, Jeff. So, something in favor of starting pitcher and ace. Beyond Scooble, though, what one or two players do you think of note might be dealt and who wants them? We've got to focus here on the Chicago White Sox, Mike. Uh, Garrett Crochet, especially if Scooble is not going to be available, is the best starting pitcher on the market. He's also a guy who comes with some complications. He's thrown more innings this season than he has in his previous four years combined. So there are questions about how much are you going to be able to pitch him and keep him healthy for the two years he has remaining after this season until he's a free agent and the Dodgers are in on him. The Orioles make a ton of sense for him. The price is going to be really high though. And the White Sox have indicated that they may be willing to hold on to him and move him this off season as opposed to now. And they've said the same about Luis Robert, who is the best bat on the market right now. There are just no hitters like this is, you know, this is a class that looked like it was going to have Pete Alonso and, then the Mets got hot. Uh, that looked like uh, at least a few other guys, maybe Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was going to be available. The Blue Jays say he is not at this point. And so all the attention has gone on to Robert. He plays center field. He hits home runs. He is a dynamic player when he's healthy. And yeah, the Dodgers are in there too. And the Phillies make a ton of sense, though. They're so good right now, they may not even need Luis Robert to make it to the World Series. Well, I'm sure Luis Robert would probably like to get off the south side at this point with that team. But let's go to contenders. Which contenders, Jeff, need to make a move? I realize there's a scarcity of bats, but who out there needs to make a move of the serious contenders? Guess who has bats? It's the Baltimore Orioles. And what they are missing right now is starting pitching depth. They lost three guys to Tommy John surgery this year. And while the Corbin Burns trade has been an absolute boon for them to this point, they would love to have somebody to pair with him at the top of their rotation come postseason time. And the thing is, if you're the Orioles, you can take so many different routes. If they want to trade a prospect, they have one of the best farm systems in baseball. If they want to trade a veteran guy, maybe Ryan Mountcastle at first base or Cedric Mullins in center field, they have the ability to do that too. So uh, the world is Baltimore's oyster right now. And uh, it's just a question of how much are they willing to invest in this particular season with the knowledge that 2025 and 26 and beyond are still going to be very fruitful and bountiful for that organization. All right, Jeff, we will get you out of here on this. And it is a tone change. It is not about the trade deadline. It's about Mike Trout. He left his first rehab game with knee soreness. What do you make of that? It's just sad because Mike Trout, over the first decade of his career, Tony, was 
the closest thing I saw to someone who was at Barry Bonds's level playing. And this is just, you know, I've been covering baseball for 21 years now and just looking at the best players I have ever seen. It's Bonds, it's Albert Pujols, it's Shohei Otani, it's Aaron Judge, and it's Mike Trout. And I, I don't think people necessarily appreciated Trout for what he was because the Angels stunk and because he made one playoff series and got swept out of it. But he had power, he had speed, he was everything. And I'm just hopeful that the rest of his 30s are a lot better than the earlier years have been because seeing Mike Trout when he is at his best is seeing a baseball player uh, who, who frankly looks like he was made in a video game. That's how good Trout was. And I hope after all the injuries, that's how good Trout can be again. I agree with that. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Let's take one last break still to come. Should Bill Belichick have taken a job with the Niners? And Knicks fans have something to celebrate. Hmm. Wonder if it's an anniversary, because that's usually about what it's been. I feel that way about it. Happy time, people. Happy 61st birthday, Carl Malone, a member of the original Nailed Dream me. Team. Malone totally outkicked the coverage after being the 13th overall draft pick out of Louisiana Tech in 1985. Malone played 19 seasons in the NBA, 18 with Utah, one final season with the Lakers. Although he never won a championship, Malone left the league with two MVPs and accolades as one of the greatest power forwards of all time. Malone ranks third all-time in career points, seventh all-time in rebounds, seventh all-time in games played. His career averages are 25 points per game, 10.1 rebounds, and a 51.6 shooting percentage. The combination of Carl Malone and John Stockton made Utah perennial title contenders. Tone, I don't think I knew what to make of Carl Malone early in his career, and I got to know him over the course of that time, 20 years. And at the end of his career, David Dupree and I, our dear friend, we're talking to Carl, and Carl says, I'm, I'm out. See you guys sometime. You should come down and hang out with me on the farm. We'll ride a tractor. We'll do some stuff. Just bring some clothes you can get some blood on. Thank you, Carl. I think I'm going to take a pass on that. I'm going to pass. Thank you for that yeah, invite. Pass. Bring some clothes you can get yeah. some blood on. Oh, it's great. A not Love so it. happy anniversary, George Brett. On this day, 41 years ago, the great third baseman was ejected from a game against the Yankees when he sprinted out of the dust, played a month later. Ironically, nine years later, McClellan was on the umpire crew when Brett got his 3,000th hit and was one of the first to congratulate him. I'm going to go old man on this, Tony. This is so great. You re we remember when this happened. It would break yeah. the internet now, and SportsCenter would have to redo an entire show for an hour on this. You don't have things like this. Baseball was so different. It was so much more exciting and daring and had such edge to it. And players like George Brett aren't even remembered anymore. George Brett is an all-time, all-time great player. Happy trails to Bill Belichick working for the Niners. Kyle Shanahan told Tim Kawakami of the Athletic that earlier this season, in the offseason rather, he offered Belichick any job on his staff. Quote, I threw it all out to him. Whatever he'd want to do, he politely turned me down, unquote. One job in particular was the Niners' then open defensive coordinator position, which has since been filled by Nick Sorensen. Shanahan, of course, was the offensive coordinator for the Falcons when they blew a 28-3 lead in the Super Bowl to Belichick's Patriots. This offer to Belichick sounds like a smart move by Shanahan, but you have to wonder how his current assistants feel about Belichick having the pick of their gigs. Tom, I know you have a different feeling about this. I think that Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, neither one of whom said anything memorable in decades around pro football, I think they're going to be great when they are officially in that capacity and paid to comment and analyze football on network. I, I think they're both going to be great and worth listening to. So you don't think on to Cincinnati is memorable? Are you nuts? Big finish. <laughs> the Knicks and Tom <laughs> Thibodeau have reportedly agreed on a three-year extension. Does that make sense to you? And now it makes sense. I think the Knicks and Thibodeau and Tibbs they're going to be a threat to Boston and everybody else this coming season if they're healthy. I do. 15-year-old Charlie Woods did not make the cut at the U.S. Junior Am. Your thoughts? 
He'll have at least three more chances. He's only 15. World number one, Good. Yannick Sinner, Good. out of the Olympics with tonsillitis. Is that a big deal? I, it's tough for me to get excited about the Olympics and tennis. I know Joker is now the new top seed, wants to win Alcaraz, too. Coco Golf was named Team USA's Olympic flag bearer next to LeBron James. That okay by you? Yes and no. I feel that basketball and tennis, like you do, are not really Olympic sports. So I know they're famous, I know they're great, but I would like to see, you know, an Olympian do it. Last one, Salt Lake City will host the 2034 Winter Olympics. I bet you're excited about that. Yeah, I was at 2002. I ain't gonna be at the next one. They got all the venues, but I, you know, eh, really? Eh, not exciting to me. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads, you can get the podcast on ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. You know what's coming Do you like next. the Cardinals yet? Sports Center. It's 30 minutes later. No.